A new iteration is come of you, of the church, of Vukon. A new man, a new woman, a devoted follower of Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. You're not who you used to be. You're a new creation. The only way that I get to live in the supernatural is when I die to my flesh and say, Oh God, start a revolution deep down inside of me. There are certain words that God can only give you when you live in His presence. Not just when you're visiting His presence. When you live in God's presence, that is what anchors you. His light is still shining bright in the Watsko Arena! We've got a whole lot of scriptures, and so um, get your Bibles open, get your notepads ready. We are in part three of a collection of talks entitled Living Together. Um, don't just love your spouse, don't just love the person you're in relation with, but learn to like them. Right. And uh, it's easy to fall in love. It's hard to live together. And uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about all sorts of different things. Talked uh, week one about the motivation of marriage, trying to give you a bigger picture, a bigger vision of how profound marriage is. Uh, last week, we talked about picking a partner. So if you're going to live with someone, if you're going to marry them, you better choose wisely. And so much of this collection, the reason why it's important to us is because God's favorite illustration for his love for a broken humanity is to illustrate it through a godly marriage. Jesus is the bridegroom in the church. That's you and I. We are the bride. And so uh, we think it's really important that we take some time and put some weight on marriages. And uh, next week, I'm going to be preaching a really, really, I think, beautiful message that I've been preparing for called How to Repair a Relationship. Because um, as we make our way there, today I want to talk to you about something quite heavy, um, something kind of weighty, but something that Don Shree and I have really been praying about and going to the Lord with as we discuss it today. Uh, today, in part three of our collection of talks, Living Together, we want to preach on the subject, the path to divorce. The path to divorce. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but sometimes the people that we love the most, we tend to hurt the worst. And it's fascinating because no one starts a relationship with hopes of ending the relationship. However, research would tell us quite clearly that 50% of marriages end in divorce. I believe it's been said that the three most powerful words in the entire world are, I love you. If that's true, how many of y'all know that I think maybe the four most painful words are, I want a divorce. It's been said about divorce that a divorce is like going to a funeral, but nobody actually died. And today, I know that there's lots of different stories. If that stat is true, that means that many people, even in this room and watching online, have gone through this pain, have gone through this trauma. And so I want to appeal first to you that we don't ever intend to shame, condemn, make anyone feel bad for what they've gone through. At the same time, it is our job and our role to speak the truth. And we want to try to help some people avoid... What Jesus said, that when we come together in marriage, let no man separate it. Let no man bring about divorce. And so we want to teach our church because divorce has such deep ramifications, such deep pain. In fact, many times I think in the world that we live in right now that it's just so quickly decided and people just jump out sometimes too early. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about necessary endings, that there are times and there are grounds for when a relationship needs to end. There are moments. Some of you in this relationship, you're dating someone right now, and you've been hearing some stuff, and your homework is, break up. And there are even biblical grounds at times for when divorce is actually the right decision, whether that's unfaithfulness or abuse. But if those things are not taking place, we as the body of Christ, we want to come together and we want to try to help celebrate and breathe life into your marriage. I've done a lot of weddings, Don Cherie's done a lot of weddings. I have never, ever gotten to the wedding and met the couple that as they're getting married that day, no one gets married with the plan to get divorced. Like I've never, I've done vows, I've done beautiful ceremonies. No one's there like, you know, with an attitude exchanging vows. For better, for worse. We'll see. 
for richer or poor, it That's better true. be richer. You know, like, <laughs> we'll see, you know, like, it doesn't happen. No one, no one like, no one exchanges the rings and like doesn't give eye contact, like put it on. <laughs> When I get ready at the end of the wedding to be like, all right, and now you may kiss your bride. I've never seen some dude be like, fist bump. You know, like, it doesn't happen. No, there's excitement. There's nerves. There's emotions. So pumped about the future that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. Yet all the married people in the room can attest that if you thought that the wedding was hard, well, get ready. Marriage is a whole lot harder. Because the truth is, is that marriage and relationships takes hard work. And Don, Shri, and I, we don't ever want to come up here and act like we've got it all together. It takes a lot of work to stay married for 16 years. This past month, we just celebrated 21 years of being together. Thank you, God. God. But it doesn't take any type of a rocket scientist to realize that things left to themselves tend to decay. Machinery doesn't get better on its own. Buildings and homes that we build. I don't care how nice the house is that you're building right now. If you don't maintain it, if you don't focus on it, if you don't care for it, it will end up destroyed. And today, as we talk about the path to divorce, I'm reminded of that old saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So today, as you're in a relationship, as you've gotten married, it will not stay healthy all by itself. Healthy marriages are by design, not by default. Yeah, and Solomon said it this way. He said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to destruction. It leads to death. And so even our best intentions, like Rich said, we need more than good intentions. We need the spirit of God. We need his strength. We need his grace in our marriages. We need him leading us, strengthening us, uh, filling our hearts up daily with love. And as we share God's word today, you know, there's a lot that we're going to share from God's word, but we want you to understand these scriptures aren't necessarily written just to marriages. They're written to humanity. They're written to our hearts. And you can really apply these scriptures whatever season of life you are in. I want you to know today, God cares about your relationships. He cares so deeply about the relationships in your life, the community that you're a part of. And a few scriptures that I think that we want to just kick off with, Jeremiah chapter 7 says this, verse 25, yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsel and in the stubbornness of their evil heart. And they went backwards, not forwards. How many of you want to go forward in your relationship? Me too. I don't want to lean on my own stubbornness. James 1 says in verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And I think so often in relationships, we get our order confused. Mm. We're quick to speak, we're quick to pop off, we're quick to let the temperature rise in our hearts. And we are not slow. We are not, we, we are not fast to listen. But listening is what we should be leaning towards in a relationship, to hear each other's hearts. And I think so often in this, in this journey of marriage that takes a lifetime, we're going the opposite direction that we want to go. And we have good intentions, but really we're in reverse. Remember when I first moved to Miami with Rich? This was probably like 16 years ago. And it was the month I moved to Miami. And how many of you know that when you move to Miami, like it's like when you get on the interstate, it's like you're going to war. Is anybody with me? Like I I came from Louisiana and everyone is very kind on the interstate. You know, we don't have as many lanes as you crazy people here in Miami. And I would come out of our apartment every day and it was like buckling up for war. And my best friend came to visit me and I'm like, I'm gonna show you Miami. But I really didn't know Miami. I didn't know anything about the city. So I'm, I'm showing her around the city. And I remember that we came to this really big like red light and I was there and it was all these different lanes all around us. And I was just nervous. You know, when you're just in a new place and you're just nervous and I'm driving my car that I'd driven through college, but it feels like it's new because I'm in this new city. And I like pull up to the red light. And um, I was so nervous that I got a little bit on the crosswalk. And so I actually put my car in reverse and like backed up a little bit just so I was right behind the line. 
And we had just gotten the ice cream and we were laughing and we were talking and then the light went green and man, I slammed on the gas. And as I slammed on the gas, I just went in reverse and guys, I hit the car behind me so hard and I, ice cream goes everywhere. I, I don't, I can't even speak. I'm in shock. I can't believe it. We get out of the car. Ice cream is all over us. And the sweetest older man was in his car and he just got out of his car and he looked at me and he didn't, sh- he didn't shout at me. He didn't scream. He didn't curse me out. He just looked into my eyes and he said, why did you do that? <laughs> I'm wondering the same thing. <laughs> I, I really think that in relationships, I've been in that, that exact situation so many times. That I'm trying to move forward. I'm eating my ice cream. Everything's good. And in one split second, it can be the way that he says something or the way that I'm thinking and interpreting it. And we go from eating ice cream to having ice cream all over us, trying to move forward to being in reverse and having a collision so many times in relationships. Mm. We think we're going somewhere and then things just explode. And it's so easy to have misunderstandings. It's so easy to suddenly shift gears and be in reverse when all we wanna do is move forward. And I think in relationships a lot of times that we think that time equals progress, that the more time we're together, of course we're moving forward. Friends, that is not the truth for your marriage. Mm. Time does not equal progress. Time does not equal maturity. Choosing to lean in and grow and allow the Holy Spirit to change our hearts is the only way we mature. It's the only way we grow. It's the only way we move forward because time can just be filled with you being in reverse. You can take one step forward and two steps back really quick without allowing your heart to be changed from the inside out. And so I guess the question for you today is, what gear are you in? Mm. Are you in drive or are you in reverse? Mm. And how often does the enemy trick us and we believe our feelings or our intentions and we throw that gear into reverse and we have collisions that we never intended to have. Hear me today, marriage happens along the journey of life. We don't get to just step out of all the other responsibilities in our life while we figure this relationship out. Marriage happens while you work. Marriage happens while you raise your kids. Can I get an amen? Marriage happens while you deal with health issues, while you struggle in other friendships, while you help with family situations. Marriage is not in and of itself. We've got to work it out along the way while we move forward on this journey of life. And um, Dr. John Gottman, who's studied relationships for decades, He has studied and identified specific patterns that relationships have that actually lead to breakup and divorce. He can actually study relationships and just study a couple for a few minutes and tell immediately with crazy accuracy after they have followed the couples for decades whether or not their marriages are going to last based upon how they interact with each other. And I think the word that he uses, pattern, is very important for us to take a close and careful look at today because there are patterns in our relationship that as we identify them, we all exhibit them one time or another. So please don't hear us as we teach today and go, oh my goodness, I've done that. I'm headed towards a breakup. No, friends, we've all done it from time to time. The important thing is for you to identify it and let the Holy Spirit deal with it. Because the question is, what gear are you in? And nobody else can shift the gear that you're in except for your heart. No one else can make the change. No one else can decide what direction you want your marriage and your relationships to head in except for you. Absolutely. And the path to destruction really has uh, five different steps or uh, road signs that you can begin to see and go, oh, wow, this is a wrong turn. I I need a turn around type of sign. And once again, I think every one of these things that we speak about, from time to time, they show up in your marriages or in your relationships, but we need to start learning how to pay attention to the signs so that we can make an adjustment. And really, the first step backwards in a marriage particularly, or any relationship, is the word criticism. That when you begin to live a life of criticism, 
you are heading in reverse. How many of y'all know criticism always starts small and gets bigger over time? I was thinking this week that, you know, uh, a chef doesn't like to hang out with a food critic. Uh, A movie director is not wanting to spend time with a film critic. Uh, An artist doesn't look for art critics to be in his circle of trust. And how many of y'all know, nobody wants to marry the spouse critic. Like, just think about that for a moment, that we don't marry someone for their entire job and responsibility to be to point out all of our flaws. Look at what the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. From the fruit of their mouth, a person's stomach is filled with the harvest of their lips. They are satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. It's fascinating that this mouth of ours can either be used for good or it can be used for destruction. And many of us, we're not using our tongue and our mouth to bless our spouse. Instead, we have fallen into the trap that all we're ever doing is pointing out their flaws. Let me just tell you, criticizing someone very rarely will ever change them. You're going to have to get a revelation on this. Because as you criticize someone, all you're doing is pushing them away. All you're doing is putting them at odds with you. See, there's a big difference between criticizing and complaining about something. Criticizing something is different from a complaint. Um, A complaint has to do with dealing with the issue. Criticizing always goes to someone's identity. I don't know if anyone ever taught you this, but this is three words you shouldn't use in marriage. Ready? Always, never, and fat. (laughs) Somebody said amen right there. (laughs) Because this is what begins to happen. You you, you know that you've stepped into a critical spirit when you're dealing with someone's identity instead of dealing with the issue. Don Shree, you never. Don Shree, you always. These words are attacking the identity of who she is. And how many of y'all know, it's actually not true. Many times we tend to criticize the flaw in the person we're with because we're actually insecure or inept in a certain area of our life. We're pointing out something in someone else that we're unhappy with in our own very lives. I just know in my life and in our story that anytime I've tried to use criticism towards Don Cherie, she resists it and she runs in the other direction. I actually don't get the outcome I am looking for. Some of you ladies right now, you've got a husband that you're trying to deal with that just, yo, he's frustrating and he's not pulling his share of the weight. And so you're waking up early and you're dealing with all the responsibilities of the house. And so as soon as he wakes up, you let him have it. I'm telling you what, you are good for nothing. I'm here doing all this work. Let me just tell you something. That critical spirit is not going to change him. You say, well, which, then what do I do? I would change criticism to celebration. What you celebrate gets repeated. This is just good leadership now for all the people out there trying to run a company, for all of you who are starting a small business going, this person's always late to work. Start celebrating them. Find one thing that they are doing right. I don't care how small it is. Yo, if that dude wakes up finally one day before 9 a.m., who are you, man of God? (laughs) Up at 9 a.m., woo, that is sexy. My God in heaven. I don't know what your issue is at the moment, but quit attacking their identity and get back to the issue. Look at what the scripture says in Proverbs chapter 15, verse one. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Go back to the person that you exchanged vows with. Go back to that person that when you were at the altar, that, wow, your eyes were wide. You were exchanging the ring. You couldn't wait to kiss your bride. You couldn't wait to kiss your groom. As you criticize them, what you're doing is you're putting the car in reverse, and it's the first step as you get onto the path of destruction. Yeah, and criticism, if you don't catch it, it leads to something far deeper and far more deadly, and that's contempt. Mm. Contempt is looking at someone as if they are beneath you. 
It is resenting them. It is looking at them as undeserving of your respect or your admiration or your love. You feel contempt, don't you? Like contempt is the way that someone views you and they view you as beneath them. And so when the words come out of their mouth, they speak to you like they are above you. Mm. And contempt is so dangerous. It can be an eye roll. It can be a sneer. It can be a jab with your words. It can be cutting down the other person. But friends, it's deep in the heart. It is deep rooted resentment and bitterness. And when I think about contempt, contempt, I'm always blown away because you may not know this, but people who are contemptuous, people who in their relationship show contempt toward their spouse, they're actually scientifically proven to be sick more often Mm. with colds, with flus, with illnesses that are infectious illnesses. And don't nudge your spouse right now if they're sick all the time. You're like, do you have a cold or do you have contempt? Do you have the flu or do you have feelings that are festering inside of your heart? But it's no surprise to me, right? Because the emotions and the feelings that we carry in our body affect our body. And contempt is not just an illness in your heart. It's an illness that will affect your bodily health. You can't allow contempt to stay. We've all shown it in different times, but guys, it's the biggest red flag for us to wake up and say, God, I'm not gonna look at the person that I love as beneath me because they did this, because they acted like that. The truth is, is that when it comes to contempt, the root cause is judgment. Mm. It's looking at someone else and saying, it's as if you're saying in your heart, well, my sins aren't as sinful as your sins. (laughs) Well, The things that I do to disgust you are not as disgusting as the things that you do to disgust me. Your weaknesses, well, my weaknesses will never be as weak as your weaknesses. My struggles will never be as difficult as your struggles. And what are you doing? You have changed the lens with which you look at your spouse. You are now judging them. And Jesus speaks to us so clearly about how destructive judgment is. In Matthew chapter seven, these are Jesus' words. He says, judge not that you will be not judged. For with the measure, with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See, you would never have contempt if you and I just first looked at the grace that we need. We would never have contempt if we honestly looked at how desperately we need the daily grace and mercy of God. And Jesus is painting a picture for those he was speaking to. It's actually humorous. I mean, I'm sure they thought it was funny. Like, have you ever walked around and saw someone with a beam in their eye? Have you actually ever seen someone with a log in their eye? No, Jesus was trying to get across a picture to us that would make us laugh because he's going, you so desperately need grace and you're fully unaware of the beam that is in your eye and you're gonna go over and babe, let me get this out. Let me just, you're gonna get the speck out of their eye. When here you are, I can tell you about how desperately I need grace. I can tell you about the mistakes that I've made. I can tell you about the weaknesses in my life. I can tell you about the insecurities. I can tell you about the desperation that I have for God. And I can change the contempt that I have for the one that I love very quickly by shifting the lens upon myself and saying, I'm so desperate for God's grace. Jesus is saying, judge not lest you be judged. You don't want to be the judge. There's only one person who is in the judgment seat. And what the scripture is really saying is, look at all the places that you could be if not for the grace of God. Before you lean over and make a big deal about the little thing that's ticking you off, your little pet peeve, why don't you be aware 
of how desperately you need the daily intervention of the divine. How do we put it in drive? Well, I love that I love that scriptures tell us that those who have been forgiven little love little. <laughs> so why don't we just reverse that? You want to love a lot? Walk in a daily awareness of how much you've been forgiven of. Let the Holy Spirit root that contempt out and allow the love to overflow and build your relationship. We can't allow contempt, and we've all shown it. Absolutely. And next week, uh, I'm going to lean into that word quite a bit as we talk about that inner relationship because that requires some real repair at times. But I want you to see the pattern because there is a predictability towards the destruction of your relationship as these things begin to grow and fester. I move from criticism to contempt, and as I live my life in our relationship in contempt, it always moves to this word called defensiveness. And this shows up in so many relationships. Listen to me loud and clear. You do not win proving your spouse to be wrong. It's just, it, it, you're not winning. I, you got to see yourself as a team. And as a team, you're both playing. I think sometimes in a marriage, one of us thinks we're the coach. One of us thinks we're the boss. Like, like no one, people don't get married to their boss. People don't, well, if you do, hello, that's another thing. But um, <laughs> hello. People, they're looking for a teammate. They're looking for someone they can walk on the journey with. And what happens is when these things are unaddressed, you go from criticism to contempt. And this third word is this word defensiveness. And just get this idea because I think you know what defensiveness is. It's when something is pointed out that could even be true because trust has begun to dry up. Instead of receiving the correction or the advice or the wisdom, we are quick to shift the blame. Just get the picture in your mind of what it looks like to defend yourself. If, if you're defending yourself, it's because there's a perception or a belief that I'm being attacked. Think about that for a moment. How on earth are you going to be married to someone that you actually believe or perceive that they're attacking you? And what do you do if someone's attacking you? You put your hands up and you protect yourself. But look at this posture. If my hands are up, I can't receive anything good. And if my hands are up, I'm always looking for my opportunity to attack. This would go completely against the metaphor and the illustration that we learned about in week one when it comes to the first marriage in the Bible, that they're naked and they feel no shame. It's an illustration of extreme vulnerability. Vulnerability is not my hands up. Vulnerability is being naked in the presence of the one that I love, completely showing all of my strengths, but also showing all of my weaknesses, my shame, the areas that I'm embarrassed. And if I have a defensive attitude, I'm never, ever going to grow. I'm always going to be behaving like I'm being attacked, and I'm always looking for my opportunity to attack my partner. Defensiveness. Some of you right now, you're like, yep, this is for my spouse. She's totally defensive. Well, bro, maybe it's because she feels like you're always attacking her. So maybe you got a part to play. Or, you know, maybe there's a dude in here who's like, yeah, my wife, she's always coming at me, you know, so I'm just up like this all the time. And maybe that, that woman in here is going, yeah, that, that's your problem. You're defensive. Maybe it's because he doesn't feel safe. One of the great things that we have been learning about that's always sort of been present in our marriage, and it's a tool. I just want to give you a tool because every one of these things that we're talking about, they show up in different areas. I believe there is a progression to them, but I also believe that it can be out of order, that you could be critical or you could be defensive or you could be in a place of contempt. And when these things are happening, it's not that they're never going to happen in your marriage. It's that you need tools for when they're happening to recognize, whoa, we're headed down the wrong path. And the psychological word that's used in relationships, I think it's important that you begin to learn, is what we call a repair attempt. Everyone say repair. Repair. Attempt. Attempt. It's an attempt to repair that which is beginning to be destroyed. I first started out, and I had a Bible teacher. Um, His name was Mr. Riley. God bless him if he's watching. And um, he and I had similar personalities, which is we were a lot of fun. We're big extroverts. But we also, when we were pushed over the edge, we had an anger problem. How fun is that for your Bible teacher to have an anger problem? Uh, John the Baptist. Um, and one day in particular, uh, I had come into class late, but the day before I had, I had not been at uh, class. And so I had a note 
letting the teachers know that day that I had been at a doctor's and that's why I was absent from school the day before, but I'd come in late to the class. When I came in late to the class, Mr. Riley said, Rich, do you have a note? Uh, I interpreted him asking me, do I have a note? Meaning, do you have a note for being gone yesterday? I said, yeah, I have a note. And I gave it to him. When I gave it to him, he perceived that when I was giving him the note, that I was trying to conspire or manipulate or fool him into thinking that this was a note for being late. When I gave him the note, he flipped out. Once again, if you're watching, Mr. Riley, I love you. Um, (laughs) What are you doing? Who do you think you are coming in here trying to fool me? Oh, I got you. And he kicked me out of the class. When he kicked me out of the class, I'm a justice guy. I'm like, whoa, no, you're misunderstanding. I was absent yesterday. And, And before you know it, it's like, it's this volatile. We're screaming at each other. He kicks me out. I have to go to the principal. I go to the principal's office. He pulls out a chart. Rich, you're in the red zone right now. I was like, this is not helping me right now. Anyways, out of that conversation, I ended up having to have this big reconciliation moment with Mr. Riley, my Bible teacher. And as we were talking, he said, Rich, here's the deal. You and I, we both are emotional. I said, speak for yourself, Mr. Riley. Um, I said, absolutely. He said, how about this? How about we have a code word? That if we ever start to feel like we're ramping up or that our emotions are taking over, We say the code word and quickly we can come back to our senses and say, we do not want this to escalate. I said, this sounds good. I said, what should the code word be? He said, well, let's agree together. I said, how about the word baseball? He said, perfect. Well, for the rest of the semester, anytime things started to rise, we'd be like, baseball! (laughs) Baseball, Mr. Riley. And, 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 And both of us would diffuse. It sounds so simple, And it sounds almost cliche and it almost sounds like that's too easy, but it's called a repair attempt. One of my friends, their mentors in our life, they've been married for 20 plus years. They're in their fifties. They have this repair attempt that whenever they find themselves in this vicious cycle on this predictable path to destruction, criticizing, contempt, defensiveness, all they simply do is reach their hand out and touch their spouse on the nose. (laughs) How many know if you're getting into a heated match, you go this? You're like, what are we doing, bro? (laughs) It's called baseball. It's a repair attempt. It's just to bring you back into reality. Great. And, And I think when you find yourself down the road of destruction, what is your repair attempt? We're gonna talk about it a lot more next week. It sounds so silly and it sounds so simple, but I would encourage all of you to try it because it snaps you back to that moment of going, wait a minute, We're not trying to hurt each other. We're not trying to live in this moment that we're trying to put each other down. We're trying to go on the journey of living together. Yeah, and the road of destruction, it's headed backwards, but we wanna move forwards. We want to grow together. We wanna mature. And when we talk about defensiveness, like it's like, it's, you can, you can see defensiveness so immediately, right? It's heard in your tone, with the words that come out of your mouth, with your body language. But if you don't catch defensiveness with your words and with your body language, uh, eventually defensiveness turns into stonewalling. Mm. So you can try to defend, okay, I don't agree, I'm not listening, and you just focus on your side, but eventually you're going to move to a place where the defensiveness internalizes. So good. And you are no longer putting up a fight with your words. You're putting up a fight and a wall in your heart. And stonewalling is about creating a wall in your heart of separation. And stonewalling is so destructive for any marriage because God created us two to become one. And when you become a stonewaller, what you do is over time, you start to separate what God has brought together. You are now pondering the decisions in your heart by yourself, fighting through the feelings and the emotion by yourself, trying to figure out this path of life by yourself, sorting it by yourself. Friends, you were never meant to do it by yourself. That wall has separated you. And Ephesians chapter 5, 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Tuning someone out, going silent, These are tactics that don't bring you together. Avoidance is not a solution. When your car is broken down, you don't just not take it in to get fixed. 
You don't avoid it. That, that is not the solution. When you have a cavity in your mouth, you don't just choose, I'm not going to go to the dentist. Why? Because you know that more pain is on the way. Mm. Avoidance does not bring a solution. And stonewalling, I mean, I can say in our marriage, like this was a, something that I did often when we first got married because I didn't know how to have healthy conversations and to disagree in a respectful way. So I would just go silent. I can literally remember moments in the car where we would be driving down I-95 and I would just be staring through the windshield like a laser. Like, I will not look at you. Has anybody ever been there? Never, never. I'm not gonna. (laughs) Like, I'm not gonna look at you. And what was I doing? I was avoiding it. And God invites us every single day into an invitation to have relationship with him, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's not an invitation of salvation. That's an invitation of daily relationship with Jesus. This morning, Jesus stood at the door of your heart and he was knocking. If anyone will hear, come to the door, open, let me in. He wants to come and sit at the table of your heart. He wants to have supper with you, he says. But friends, if Jesus isn't going to barge into your heart, Your spouse can never tear down the wall that you've put up. If God himself has decided that he'd give only you the power to open up the door from the inside and let him in, don't you know that your spouse can't tear down the wall that you have placed between you? Only you can let your spouse in. Like my son, Wild, he's three and he's learning to use the restroom. And when he go, we won't go into that, by the way. But when he walks into our restroom, he says something to me. He goes, privacy, mom. Privacy. He's three. He's three. I think I taught him that word, actually. Now I regret it. And so I shut the door and he'll lock it. And I say, Wild, you got to unlock the door. And he'll be laughing on the other side of the door, you know. I'll say, wild, I'm not kidding, unlock the door. And what does he have to do? He unlocks the door because it's an inside job. And today, if there's a separation, it might just be because you put up a wall. It might just be because you, through your resentment, through your criticism, through the contempt, through your defensiveness, have decided that you are safer alone than with the one that you pledged to love. And I think when it comes to the journey of following Jesus and loving one another, Rich hit it on the head. Vulnerability is the only way forward. Honesty about what's going on in my heart is the only way that I can unlock the door and let him in. Friends, we have such a warped view of what healthy relationships look like because of what culture has painted through movies. It's okay men to have a conversation with your spouse and let them in and say, I don't know what the answer is to what we're facing. Mm. I'm overwhelmed. I feel afraid. I'm trying to figure it out too. And what happens if you stonewall is that you don't let the other person in so that you can fight together and you're weaker alone. Friends, you may be going into a party and the husband may need to be honest and say, I, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety going into this party. I'm not, I, I'm not super comfortable being around a lot of people. What is he doing? He's tearing down the wall, inviting her in, and it creates intimacy. She may be walking in the party going, well, I feel uneasy because I had this run in with this person and there's a little history here. And as I walk in, I'm nervous. But if she's stonewalled, she's fighting and wrestling all alone. When intimacy is when you take down the wall and say, this is honestly how I feel. I'm afraid. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. I've never had these feelings before. I'm wrestling with something, but Stonewall keeps the love out. But when you feel safe and secure, let them in. And watch how God can heal and restore your relationship. You were not brought in this marriage to fight your battles alone. You were brought together to face everything in life. Do you hear me? Everything in life. Together, you're better together. One of the great truths that has impacted my marriage for the last 16 years is this little concept of don't focus on thinking alike, but focus on thinking together. 
that we're both bringing the best of who we are through a place of vulnerability. And even my prayer today, as we were gearing up for this weekend and we're really trying to make sure that we're watching our tone because there's lots of different types of pain and trauma and hurt in the room. My hope is that I can't solve all of your marriage problems, but if I can implore you, if we can encourage you enough to simply start to get vulnerable with the person that you fell in love with, the person that you made vows to, it can bring a whole world of healing. You know, my accountability partner, people always ask about this question about my accountability partner. I have accountability partners, but Don is my first accountability partner. If I'm struggling with an area of lust, I tell her about it. What? My wife would kill me. What? It's because there's a vulnerability of trust to say, this is where I'm at. And I just want to encourage the room. I want to encourage those online that you don't just have to think alike, but thinking together, you become your greatest allies. You become great assets in each other's lives. And this pattern of predictability, I hate going here today, but it's just, you've got to see how it begins. It starts with criticism that goes, you know, without acknowledging it, it moves to contempt, this kind of silent resentfulness into a defensiveness that we're always attacking, we're always projecting. There can even be truth being shared, but that person can't hear it because they're in defense mode. And finally, it moves to stonewalling where you are, you might be in the relationship, you might be in the house, but no longer are you in the relationship. Your heart is somewhere else. And what happens? The thing happens. You move to cheating. And some of us in the room today are having an affair and we don't even know it. Because when I use the word cheating in an affair, not all affairs and not all cheating are sexual in nature. An affair is anytime you're putting something above your spouse. And maybe you're not cheating with another person. Maybe you haven't crossed the line that you've found yourself in this romantic affair. Although I believe that some even in the room today and watching online are in that place. And I believe there can be healing and restoration as you step into the light and as there's vulnerability and repentance and forgiveness. Trust is regained. But when I use the word cheating, it's like some of you, you're cheating on your spouse with your job. You're more in love with your job than you are that person that you exchange. You didn't exchange vows with your job. You didn't put a ring on your hobbies. You didn't put a ring on the things that bring you pleasure. Oh, some of you are cheating on your spouse with your kids. Some of y'all, like, you have the best, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. We just love our kids, man. You've been to 14 kids events and somehow you haven't been on a date night in a month. I know, but they need us. You know what your kids need? More than your love, more than your affection, your kids need to see you love your spouse well. You wanna bring stability, you wanna bring consistency, you wanna bring courage to the home. Love your wife, love your husband. You had a life long before they showed up. Yeah. I'm gonna have to remind my boys, hey, let me tell y'all something. You're gonna be in this house for 18 years and one day I already know you're gonna leave this house and you're gonna leave me. And I'm gonna be left with this woman. So guess what, bro? She comes first. Rules are pretty simple in our house. Tell the truth and honor your mom. Some of y'all just need to be reminded, man, like God bless those kids, but they're not God. It's not your spouse. I love your children. I'm for your children. I'm for my kids. But my kids came from holy matrimony that Don Tree and I got to collaborate with the author and the maker of the universe. And a cord of three strands, me and Don Tree with God, we got to procreate and create Wyatt and Wild and Waylon. Those kids don't come first. It's Don Cherie for me. Those kids need to know it when your kids need to know it. So the path to divorce is paved in criticism. It's paved in contempt. It's paved in defensiveness. It's paved in stonewalling. And lastly, it's paved with cheating. And today, I'm gonna spend a lot more time next week talking about how do I repair these things if these things are taking place? How do we reconcile? What does the Bible say about that? I wanna give some tools next week, but even as we're getting ready to close today, I don't wanna leave people in a hopeless spot. 
I want to simply awaken your soul. Those of you that are married, those of you that are dating, some of you that are about to get married on the other side of divorce. I, I don't know where you're at, maybe widowed. You know, last night I was with a friend of ours that we've been friends with for well over a decade and she lost her husband uh, this past summer. And she was talking to us about the last six months as she has lost this person that she was married to for decades, how in death, it puts everything in perspective. And she was sharing with us how it's the little things. In fact, it's some of the annoying things, some of the things that she used to criticize, some of the things that used to kind of lock her up and make her in a place of contempt or defensive. It's those things that she misses. She misses the small annoyances of her husband asking her, uh, what should I have for breakfast today? And she would say, well, you should know what you want for breakfast. Don't make me make a decision for you. He would come and say, what shoes should I wear today? She would say, you pick out your own shoes, bro. But she says now in death, in loss, she misses that. I just wanna try to put up a road sign today that some of you are on the wrong turn. Hear me loud and clear. You're gonna miss this. You're gonna miss this. Don't quit too soon. Don't, don't end it right now. Like you're gonna miss some of this stuff that's been annoying you, that's been frustrating you. It's gonna be more painful than you could have imagined. Give it another shot. Go see a counselor. Get to a crew this week and talk to someone. Come out of hiding, come out of darkness and say, I need help. We all need help. That's what church is. Dontre and I are not the experts in the house. We're on the journey of faith with you. Yeah. We need people around us, surrounding us in our marriage. We need people to weigh into it, to speak into it, to cheer us on, to celebrate and say, don't quit. And I was talking to my friend last night and she was so vulnerable and so honest. And she said this language to me that I just, it wasn't in my notes, but as we get ready to close today, I just want to say this to you. She said, Rich, I have discovered Christ in the crisis. And maybe your marriage is in crisis. Maybe your life is in crisis today. Maybe your kids are in crisis. Can I encourage you that you can find Christ in the center of the crisis? That he is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He'll never leave, he'll never forsake you. He has answers for you, he has hope for you, he has mercy for you, he has grace for you. He has reconciliation for you, salvation, and deliverance, hope and healing. He loves you. Today, as you surrender your life, as you surrender your marriage, your home, he steps in and says, follow me. Today, it's our hope and our prayer that some of you that are on the verge of that relationship falling apart, that through the help of God's spirit, and through the help of God's word, that today you could make a U-turn, that today you could take the car out of reverse and put it back into drive, little steps in the right direction you're gonna find yourself going a very long way. and You're gonna find yourself stepping into the relationship that God has designed for you. It's not easy, it takes work, but with God's help, we believe it's possible. If you believe it, can you go ahead and help me thank God today all over the room. Hey, this is Rich and Don Shree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.